Hey friends, it's Rick and this is Xing the Gap. Okay, I'm breaking the rules again, because although creativity needs constraints, sometimes we need to break free from them. Thus far, I've spoken only to extraordinary Canadians, but today I'm Xing the gap across the US border to speak with some of our amazing neighbors to the south, Dan Millman and his daughter, Sierra Posada. Dan's a giant in the field of personal development. His first book, Way of the Peaceful Warrior, was adapted into a film starring Nick Nolte and has changed countless lives, including mine. Sierra is also an accomplished writer and voice actor who produces audiobooks with her life partner Sarah Fim and collaborates on books with her dad, like The Creative Compass, writing your way from inspiration to publication. As an intergen trio, we talk about the creative journey, collaborating through difference, a peaceful heart and a warrior spirit, the theater of life, the many characters within us, cultivating a flexible mind, finding our own path, the influence of Joseph Campbell, the Buddha's final words, and life-changing trivia. Gandalf or Dumbledore? Courage will now be your best defense against the storm that is at hand. That and such hope as I bring. You do that so well. I'm Thank you very much. But it is Dumbledore. <laughs> Gandalf. Oh, really? I should know yeah. that. I love okay. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Listen and learn, my friends. Xing the gap. Dan Millman, Sierra Prasada, welcome. Thank, Thank you, Rick. So, Dan, you and I met after you came to see my show, Boom, off Broadway, and you left your card. I got in touch. We met for tea. You shared your story. I was blown away. Sierra, you and I have never met until today, but I believe you and your partner, Sarah, from also might have seen the show. Is that correct? We did, and we really enjoyed it. Now, did you tell Dan about it or, or was it vice versa? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I often tell my parents, you know, oh, there's a great show. At least I did before COVID, <laughs> you know, right, yeah. you should go see it when it comes to live theater. Intergenerational storytelling. I love that. We're going to get to it. But before we do, can you please each give me the, the kind of short story version of who you are? Maybe we'll start with you, Dan. Okay. Um, I was uh, a kid who loved to jump on the trampoline and did not know that would lead to a college scholarship in gymnastics and all that followed. Uh, I ended up writing a book called Way of the Peaceful Warrior, and I just completed and was published my uh, my 18th book. Um, and so I write and I speak worldwide, and that's pretty much what I do. For those who've heard of Way of the Peaceful Warrior, that will mean something. For those who haven't, um, I teach about living with a peaceful heart, but also recognizing there are times we need a warrior spirit just to face the challenges of everyday life. So that is, uh, in a sense, my genre and my area of teaching. Um, and, and that's it in a nutshell. And if I could plug your latest book, because you just said the title, uh, Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit, which is a memoir. And your daughter, Sierra, helped produce the audiobook. So why don't we hand it over to you, Sierra? Sure. So I grew up with a trampoline in my backyard, thanks to my dad. Um, and because of that, maybe I believed, you know, in more unlikely or impossible things because my life has taken me on kind of a wild ride. Um, I've been living in New York now for a few years and working as continuing to write uh, and also uh, starting an audiobook business with my husband. And But it's been a long and winding road getting here that took me through living in Boston and in Washington, D.C. after growing up in California and also living overseas in Lebanon, where I wrote my first book, Creative Lives, Portraits of Lebanese Artists. Um, and that is actually what partly led to my working on this collaboration with my father. Um, there's a theme that you'll see, creative lives led to the creative compass. And I've since written a novel which deals with creativity and memory and grief and you might even say a sort of a fictional sequel to the other books. Now, I have a good relationship with my two daughters who are 15 and 19 now. We, you know, we laugh, we cry, we respect each other. They like what I do. We watch New Girl. Now, Dan and Sierra, many children can barely tolerate their parents for Thanksgiving weekend. And you've actually written books together. So tell me about certain gaps of understanding between generations and you specifically that you had to bridge in order to to make it work. You know, my dad and I have a lot in common and that we are both very energetic, you know, optimistic, 
can do type people um, and also can be stubborn. So inevitably, there was the occasional, you know, creative clash in working together. But I think because um, my parents have always found it very important for us to have an open dialogue, you know, that's been a part of our whole lives. And I, I don't think that my sister or I, uh, my, I have a younger sister, ever felt like there wasn't something we could bring to my parents and talk to them about. Um, and there also wasn't uh, an undue emphasis. I feel like the, um, you know, the personal development field can sometimes get tarred with this brush of, you know, needing to be positive all the time. And I would say that there wasn't this undue emphasis on always needing to be positive. You could work toward things. We There was a presumption of good faith. And I think that's really what fueled our ability to work on this book together. Because there's no question, I'm sure my dad can weigh on this too. Writing a book by yourself is challenging. Writing a book by, you know, with someone else, I think is more than doubly challenging. Wow. Dan, you want to expand on that? You know, I remember distinctly when she was about um, 10 years old, I drew a graph and said, Sierra, you know, it just struck me that this is kind of my intelligence curve. And you can see it's leveling off as I get older. Yours is just curving upward. And someday uh, those lines will cross. And she patted me on the head and said, Dad, I think they already have. (laughs) (laughs) And actually, she was quite correct uh, in that. So uh, our collaboration, yeah, there's a saying that uh, he or she who has a partner has a master. You have to run everything by them. And we have different styles, which is wonderful. You know, it's very complimentary, but uh, that did lead to some different perspectives. And she did the heavy lifting on the Creative Compass. Uh, They put my name for commercial reasons, since I'm better known right now. Now, uh, temporarily. Um, so they put Dan Millman and Sierra Prasada, but really she mostly wrote the book. She structured it, organized it, assigned me chapters to write. <laughs> so that's that's uh, how I would weigh in about our, our relationship, which is the love is always there. You know, they know they're loved and we knew that we were loved too. And, and that was the foundation for uh, all that followed. Love. It doesn't get talked about much in creativity classes, but in my opinion, love is the key to collaboration. Of course, a creative team needs passion, but love is just as important, not just for the project, but for each other. And as anyone who has ever loved knows, it's complicated, it's crazy making, and it's full of compromises and contradictions. But when you collaborate with love, it means you respect each other's differences and you trust each other to be able to work through those differences in good faith. Sierra, I noticed in the book description for Creative Compass, it's written, a guide should give clear directions, then get out of your way. Did your dad do that well in your life? Would he allow you to follow your path? That's a great question. Um, That is a very hard thing to do, of course, when, you know, in those sort of crucial years of adolescence, you know, even going into the college years with the way contemporary society treats education, I think it's very difficult for parents. Parents have to play a huge role. And inevitably, I think almost all children are going to look back on this period and recognize that some of their formative, like the formative decisions that shape their life were not made exclusively by then, which is something one spends one's life thinking about. So I would say that as I've gotten older, I've become much more compassionate looking back on how difficult it was to help someone else make decisions and how, you know, how complex a a process that is. Um, And because my father also, you know, he has an outsized role in the world. So it was almost inevitable that at first he would have more of an outsized role in my life because I was looking for role models. And as a cusper, you know, as we've talked Mm -hmm. about, as someone born kind of between generations and really coming of age at a time when the internet, you know, wasn't, definitely wasn't what it is now and really wasn't as much of a thing at all. And so I was even more dependent on, you know, who is this person who's most proximate to me and what are they doing? And so I would say that it wasn't so much my father's, anything my father did, but it definitely was, it's just complex on a generational level, you know, venturing out into the world. And it's very different to look back now and see how young people are making that progress from a much earlier age, just because of a much greater 
view, though not necessarily, you know, a non-distorted view, but a view of the world. Right. And I agree with what Dan said before as well, that younger generations are far better educated about so many more things. They have other challenges that they're facing in terms of how they process information. And I'm saying they, because you're, you're pretty much a Gen X or millennial cusper as you know, you're, I was born in 1970. Exactly. You were born probably 1980, 1980. Then in, in your new memoir, uh, peaceful heart, warrior spirit, there's so many ideas that resonated with me, but I think the one that I'd like to tap into a little bit is as a theater guy who does solo shows and embodies a lot of characters within me in order to better understand the world and then reflect it to my audience. You wrote at some point in the book of treating life as theater and identifying with the many characters inside all of us and learning to view the characters with humor and compassion and empathy, but from a distance, like with that perspective that we're not a fixed self, we're this multiple impermanent selves. I wonder if you could elaborate on this idea of many characters embodied within us, because I feel a lot of our contemporary discussion today is around the issue of identity, and it's a very complex thing. And I'm wondering what your boomer perspective might be on this. Well, I'll start with a brief anecdote. Somebody came up to me once and said, hey, Dan, you seem like a nice guy. I said, sometimes. Because, because uh, life is a series of moments, intelligent moments, stupid moments, uh, uh, neurotic moments, stable moments. Uh, so we, we all uh, have these changes and we, we have this idea. We are an identity. I am a somebody, as you just pointed out, Rick. Um, but I think we change all the time in different circumstances. Um, I once asked the fourth mentor of the four mentors I describe in the book that I studied with over a 20-year period, the sage, I once said, isn't an optimal mind a peaceful mind? And he said, no. He said, if your house is on fire, you probably don't want to be cultivating a peaceful mind. It has to be active and alert. So perhaps a flexible mind is is the best approach. And that flexibility uh, entails a recognition of different characters in our psyche, which the first mentor that I mentioned in the book, the professor, through his school, I came across in an advanced training, these characters of the psyche that helped explain a lot of our internal contradiction. Um, For example, we, somebody asks us for money on the street and we either go into the sentimental and say, of course I have money for you. But later we may be walking away saying, you know, why don't they get a job or why, why can't they, you know, they probably aren't spending the money on a good thing, whatever. Uh, Or we go through the rigid and say, what do you mean spare change? I don't have any money for you, you know, work for it, do something. But as we walk away, the sentimental part comes out. So the the rigid, the sentimental, the Puritan and the hedonist, the peacock and the chicken, uh, people with uh, exaggerated self-respect or lack of self-respect, the believer or the doubter. So we have these different characters that account for this contradiction in our own characters. And by by seeing um, these characters stepping back and observing ourselves, it gives us a lens to understand uh, our own uh, our own craziness. Uh, the guru, the second of the four mentors, once said we spend, but many of us spend half our day analyzing our craziness and the other half of the day dramatizing it. But it's important not to use them as judgments, but be compassionate. And it helps us to give cut ourselves a little slack too and just uh, recognize with some humor, some cosmic humor, uh, the, the theater of life. The theater of life. In Shakespeare's play As You Like It, the melancholy Jaques muses that all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. He then goes on to list the seven parts we play in life, from the infant all the way to second childishness and mere oblivion. When I was a young actor trying to figure out who I was, the monologue had a huge influence on me, as did anything that danced around this idea of the shifting self. Robertson Davies' The Deptford Trilogy, Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis, and a biggie for me, Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces. I want to twist this to a question for you, Sierra, because I know in The Creative Compass, you, you, um, you'd you speak about the five stages of the creative process, but you also tether it to this, I guess what I'll call the hero's journey. And it makes me think of mythology and archetypal storytelling. And I wonder, are you a, a Joseph Campbell fan? Is that something that crossed your radar or, or is that just me showing my age? Oh, no, you're right on. I actually, um, I am a Joseph Campbell fan, and I actually worked briefly as a copy editor 
for the Joseph Campbell Foundation. Wow. <laughs> Funnily enough. I'm geeking um, out here. <laughs> yeah. There is a wonderful, I don't know if you ever, you've ever read this, come across this short piece from Joseph Campbell. Um, I believe it's called The Forest. It's very short. And it talks about this idea of going into the forest and each person needing to find their own way, because if there's a path, then it is someone else's path. And I, I've always loved this image. Uh-huh. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, no, no that is great. I, I was a big fan of um, The Power of Myth and the, the PBS series. And I remember getting the audio cassette and feeling very empowered and also calmed in a way, listening to Joseph Campbell's voice. He had a very soothing voice. I felt Bill Moyers was a terrific interviewer, but it had a huge effect on me growing up. I think that the image of the journey just never gets old. And it was really natural for my dad and I to seize on that and to see. And partly we wanted this idea. I mean, I think partly it's it's contemporary that we tend to see things in cinematic terms, you know, as though we're the movie makers and the movie watchers at the same time. So I really had this image in my mind working on the book more and more of this aerial view, almost like the beginning of a film and seeing this route sort of emerge from, uh, I don't know, from, from the jungle, from a mountain, from a desert and thinking of the artist as crossing that and as inevitably through the rewards of their own labor coming across collective guideposts. In, in my new book, there is a quote at the epilogue, an epigraph by Thomas Merton. And he said, looking for God, enlightenment, reality is like seeking a path in a field of snow. If there's no path and you're looking for one, walk across the field and there is your path. And, you know, my dad and I have already talked a little bit about just how we're different. And that was one reason we felt we could work on this book together, because, you know, in, in addition to representing different archetypes ourselves, we also came at the process of writing from very different places. And so, you know, we came, in a sense, we were fellow journeyers, you know, meeting on the road and swapping stories and comparing different differences in progress, different times, different ideas, different constraints. And that all came together in the, in the form of these five stages, dream, draft, develop, which is the hinge stage, refine, and share. And, you know, that's the journey that not just writers, but really every creative artist covers in one form or another, spending more or less time in in one stage or another. Right. It makes me think of life as a creative process and change being kind of the catalyst, right? So from the point of view of gaps in our society, I feel that much of it has to do with the pace of change, the consequences of change, sometimes the resistance to change. So Dan, I wonder how you balance your own inward, outward work and how it feeds into your view of change in society. Sure. Um, I just spoke with someone, uh, a radio uh, host uh, the other day who remembers attending my first public talk ever teaching in this big picture mode in 19, early 1980s. And at that time, before the internet, I said, one thing I think we can agree on is the pace of change is accelerating uh, and the energy is building. And that means some people will sort of go into bliss states and others are going to go a little crazy. Um, and, and that was in nine, early, early 80s. And we c- couldn't have even conceived of the pace of change today. And one of the memes that I tend to repeat in, in, in various seminars is that um, change comes at us in waves that we can't control or predict, as most of us are learning today. Um, but we can learn to surf those waves. Waves of change. The phrase reminds me of an image that one of my mentors, Robert Lepage, drew on the blackboard when he came to speak at my architecture school. He drew a bunch of arrows pointing towards a dot and said that was how some people created, with all their energy pointed towards a preconceived end. Then he drew another dot with arrows pointing outwards, leading to more dots and more arrows and said that's how he creates. There's no end, just a constantly evolving creation, riding these waves of change. It sounded a hell of a lot more natural to me, and a way better image of what life actually looks like. 
well, we all know that, um, you know, the earth, we could view the earth as a kind of school for souls, if you will, and daily life is our classroom. So we are, we are changing. We can't help but change in response to our circumstances. Lessons repeat themselves until we learn them. And if we don't learn the easy ones, they get more dramatic. So one way or the other, daily life will teach us everything we need to learn to evolve. Uh, a man wrote to me after reading my first book, Way of the Peaceful Warrior, and said, Dan, now that I've read your book, I'm really interested in the spiritual practice, but how do I have the time? I have a wife and three children and a full-time job. And he came to understand his wife, his children, his full-time job were his primary uh, spiritual practices. And they'll develop him more than sitting in a cave and meditating. I know because I've done both. So to me, uh, we're going to change. And we can either try to change our circumstances in the world around us, which can be a, a valuable pursuit um, or a wild goose chase, or we can focus more on what we can control, which is, is changing ourselves. And I think there's a place we have to rest uh, uh, in and as and through who we are and, and, and just uh, do our best. Supposedly, that, that was the Buddha's final words on earth. Uh, do your best. Just do your best. I love that. <laughs> now, Sierra, you said in, in an email exchange that we had that, you know, as much as you sit on the cusp and, you know, have that sort of Buddha perspective on, you know, <laughs> sitting under the tree, looking at both generations, you also have that anxiety of just being a human being. And I imagine you, you have times where you feel you're not doing your best and you have times where you're feeling whatever anxiety and mental health issues we all go through in our lives. Where are you at this stage in 2022? Are you feeling at peace with what you're doing or is there just a constant uh, that's, that's nagging at you? Uh, that's a wonderful question. You know, it's interesting, this whole concept of doing one's best because as a sort of surface statement, of course, I mean, who would, who wouldn't want to do, you know, their best, I think, though, that my own perspective on anyone's best started to change a lot the more I studied theater and the more I got really into studying the voice in the last 10 years. And so much of that also, I ended up studying um, Linklater technique, which has to do with um, freeing unnecessary tension, and also Alexander technique, which has a similar purpose. And in working on what many might, who are not familiar with them, consider more esoteric disciplines. I began to see just how much tension there was in the idea of doing one's best, because it, at least in contemporary society, it tends to go with the idea of forcing it, <laughs> driving it, <laughs> you know, grinding it out. And I began to see that, um, that that was just one approach and it wasn't necessarily the most effective approach. I mean, I can only speak for myself, you know, certainly for me. But it was such a wonderful discovery to realize that it wasn't actually necessary, you know, to hold yourself in your chair, like to help gravity out. And gravity actually will, will take care of itself, <laughs> you know. So maybe I see doing your best now as things like letting gravity take care of itself. <laughs> mm, that makes me think of, Dan, in your trampolining career and those moments where you just have to let go of thinking which seems terrifying because you're in a life and death precarious situation, but there is a matter of letting go. And I'm not talking about the Disney movie with that big song called let it go, but that's a pretty powerful phrase as well. Let it go. Now, speaking of letting go and doing your best, I think that's a terrific segue to the game show. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> This is absolutely meaningless fun and play, and I know you know the value of play. So we're going to jump right in, okay? Sure. Sounds okay. great. What product had this famous slogan? I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I'd like to buy the world a... Anyone? Oh, Dan. Sierra, take it. Sierra. Coca-Cola? Coca-Cola. That's right. So, and if you know the answer right away, you can stop me. You don't have to wait till I, uh, till okay. I give it to you. Okay. But we get uh -huh. to hear your delightful singing. Oh, come yes. on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here's a book question. According to Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, what is the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything? It's been too long since I read the book. Do you recall, Sierra? I 
Hint, it's a number. It's a weird number. It's not one. It's something like 13 or 12 or some. 42. 42. Ah. Of course. Of course. How can we miss that? <laughs> okay, this that makes is for, so much sense. Of course. <laughs> this is for you, Dan. Name the author of the Twilight series. Oh, a woman. Um, that is not specific enough. No, I know, but I, uh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, I didn't Time's up. Read the Sierra? Okay, Sierra. Okay, I know it's Stephanie Myers, but at first I thought you meant the Twilight Zone. <laughs> oh, no. I could have told you that one. <laughs> okay, Dan, you get an extra point for telling me who created the Twilight Zone or what's the. Rod Serling. That's hey, a generation. You each that's get a, a generational there. answer. Yes. Bingo. Okay, maybe you'll know this, Dan. Which two mythical creatures hate each other in the Twilight series? Yeah, the werewolf and the vampire. Ding. Name the author of the Hunger Games trilogy. I'm. Is it. I think it's Susan. I'm totally forgetting her name, even though I've read and enjoyed the Hunger Games trilogy. It's Suzanne. I just Collins. Don't okay, Thank name you. Sierra. Name the heroine of the I books. Um, Katniss Everdeen. Ding. Good. Uh, cartoon question. This comic strip by Hank Ketchum featured Dennis, who was nicknamed Menace. Yes, Dan, you get a point there. Uh, bonus Again. points. Who was Dennis's grouchy neighbor? Mr. Mm. Mm. Mr. I sh should know it because it's a generational thing. I grew up on Dennis the Menace. And Sierra, you don't know this, do you? Kitchen. No, I Mr. Wilson. Oh, Mr. <laughs> Wilson, right. Now, this is going to be right in between you, maybe. Which rich, really difficult cartoon kid had an imaginary stuffed tiger named after a philosopher? <laughs> <laughs> Calvin Anyone? and Hobbes. Yeah, Calvin, Calvin. and Hobbes. Yeah, I love them. Yeah. Yeah. Sierra has all of them, I believe. Yeah. They were so important to me at a certain stage of my life. I loved him. Okay, <laughs> this is a, a famous sage and hero question. I'm going to give you a series of quotes. You have to tell me if it's Gandalf or Dumbledore. Okay. I'm going to start with you, Sierra. But the only measure that he knows is desire for power, and so he judges all hearts. Sierra. Gandalf. Correct. Uh, Dan. Gandalf. Courage will now be your best defense against the storm that is at hand. That and such hope as I bring. You do that so well. I'm Thank just you very awestruck. Much. But it is Dumbledore. Eh. Gandalf. Oh, really? Too bad. I should know yeah. that. I love okay. Lord of the Rings. Okay. <laughs> okay, Sierra. It is the unknown we fear when we look upon death and darkness. Nothing more. I believe that's Dumbledore. Correct. Okay, yep. Dan. Okay. Numbing the pain for a while will make it worse when you finally feel it. That sounds like Dumbledore, too. Correct. And one more each. Sierra, all we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. I'm going to go with Dumbledore for that one as well. Eh, Gandalf. Ah! I bet Dan, Dan was nodding. He knew that one. Yeah, okay. That and one. finally, it is not despair, for despair is only for those who see the end beyond all doubt. We do not. Oh, I have to say Gandalf. You are correct. Okay, very yeah. well done. Yeah. I don't know where we are with points, but it just doesn't matter. Okay, this is open, <laughs> no, open to both of you. Raise your hand if you know it. What satirical magazine featured Spy versus Spy? Dan. M Mad Magazine. Correct. Movie questions. Besides Way of the Peaceful Warrior, name another Nick Nolte movie. Dan. Prince of Tides. Yes, nominated for an Oscar for that one. Okay. In... Karate Kid 5, the recent, well, 2010 reboot, who was cast as mentor and mentee? Anyone? Sure. Yeah, Dan. Jackie Chan was the mentor and Will Smith Jr. I, I, um, uh, was Jaden the... Smith. Yeah. Oh, Jaden Smith, of course. Jaden uh, Smith. Dan's running away with it here. Okay. Oh. Maybe you'll know this, Sierra. What cult classic 1999 film featured a character who was split into two selves, and one of them is badass Tyler Durden, played by Brad Pitt? Oh, Fight Club. Correct. What famous sage, who may have been channeling you, Dan, once said, No. Oh. Or do not. There is no try. Dan? Yoda. Yoda. Okay, Yoda. All right. Easy question. Uh, Sierra, finish this lyric. Wop, bam, a loo, bop, a wop, bam. Boom. Good. Who sings it? Um. Eh. Over to Dan. I'm going to guess Fats Domino. Nope. Little Richard. Little All right. Richard. All I'm right. going to play a couple Let's, of uh, songs on my guitar here. 
There's something happening here. What it is, I mean, exactly. Yep, Sierra. Buffalo Springfield. Um, what's it called? It's called. Um, I'll give you the point. For yeah, what? It's, it's for what worth. It's worth. What famous young gymnast scored a perfect 10 at the 1976 Montreal Olympics? Dan? Sierra, you could answer it, but I know, obviously. Nadia Komenich. Yes. Uh, Sierra, do you know what country Nadia's from? Romania. Bingo. You each get a point. What was the first video game featuring two sliding paddles and a dot going, boop, Dan? Pong. Okay. Name a TV show that spun off from Happy Days. Chachi and somebody. Chachi and... <laughs> Jody loves, loves Chachi. Chachi. You chose right. the worst one of all of them. <laughs> I there was know. I Laverne never saw and it, Shirley. but I know of the show. Laverne and Shirley. Oh, Laverne and Shirley. Mork and Mindy. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> what TV show featured an alien life form starring a puppet? Elf? Yes, correct. And that is how we're going to end our stupid game show. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Thank you, Sierra, for playing. Well, that was fun. Hey, Sierra, Dan, thanks again and uh, take care. And we hope that uh, come your midterm elections that, you know, you're not all running up to Canada. <laughs> yes, Seriously. You, you bet. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So well, long, thanks folks. Thanks again, Rick. Take, take care. care, Rick. Take care. Bye. Bye. Be well. Bye-bye. And goodbye to you, friends. I hope you were inspired, enlightened, and entertained. As always, a big thank you to my guests, Dan Millman and Sierra Prasada. If you'd like to find out more about their books and other projects, you can visit PeacefulWarrior.com or SierraPrasada.com. My name's Rick Miller, and I wrote, recorded, and edited this episode with multimedia by my team at Kidoons. For more info about the Boom Trilogy and our many other projects, visit Kidoons.com or BoomTheShow.com. Thanks also to my partners on this podcast, Leap, an online community where life experience meets innovation. Created by Cabby, the Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation. For more info or to become a Leap member, visit cabby.com slash leap. If you're on a podcast player, please follow us, write a review, and tell someone about this or other episodes you liked. You can also send any questions, comments, feedback to me at Rick Miller Actor on Twitter or Instagram or rick at rickmiller.ca by email. And hey, in a polarized world, you have a choice. Build a wall or build a bridge. Build bridges, not walls. Xing the gap.